Hi, I'm Mike Hatfield with History River, and I'm going to talk about the book Lucifer's Hammer by Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell. Personally, my main theme takes on it have always been about the same thing. It talks about human nature. It talks about our willingness to bend our moral compass to survive. It talks about the fragility of civilization as we know it and how humans uh, as a group or as individuals will overcome obstacles, develop new skills, and reinvent new technologies if necessary, anything to survive. Stay with me here and uh, I'm going to give you a rundown of a couple of the major story themes and uh, get some coffee going here in the backwoods. I'll be with you in a minute starts you out long before uh, the doomsday hits the fan, let's just say. They start out, they've written a couple of novels, and they always follow this, about the same writing devices. They start out, it's day to day, average, average Tuesday in LA, and they show, they introduce the main characters, and they show them going about their day-to-day -day lives. This is the mundane urban stuff. Uh, the characters are bored with their lives. The keeping up with the Joneses, you know, the mun, let's just say the boring life of suburban living. Not my cup of tea. But the authors use this. They show just how much civilization and the modern conveniences are taken for granted. Uh, the characters are examining, oh, I'm stuck in LA traffic, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I've got this bill to pay or this social party to go to. And really, I mean, it's something that the average reader can relate to. Maybe we're not all rich. Maybe we don't all live in Hollywood. But I think everybody can you know, relate to that in one fashion or another. Oh, it's a Tuesday, I've got to go to the office. Oh, it's a Thursday, the kids have soccer practice, blah, blah, blah. Well, the authors use that as a vehicle to move the story forward. And they show that in contrast. After the meteor strike, after Lucifer's hammer has fallen, and civilization as we know it has basically come to an end, it is a global disaster. They show just how badly we would miss those conveniences that we took for granted so well uh, just days before. Things like groceries. Going to the grocery store. Everybody hates going to the grocery store. Nobody likes standing in long lines, walking up and down the aisles looking for a quart of milk or that last bag of Oreos. Somebody always seems to beat you to. But now, post hammer, there are no grocery stores. What do you do? You can watch shows on TV like Doomsday Prepper, where you see crazy people who have a basement filled with enough freeze dried Oreos and ice cream to keep them pigging out on the couch until they die of old age. But eventually, those types of supplies run out, and the authors explore this issue. What do you do? Most people these days don't hunt, particularly if you live in or were raised in an urban environment. Um, if you grew up in the big city, chances are you don't hunt. You, you might have taken it up as a sport. You might pay a guide to take you out on some canned hunt or something. But generally, the average Joe who grew up in the city doesn't have any outdoorsy type skills. Basic camping skills. That's about the best you can hope for. Once the grocery stores aren't out and you're hunting for your survival, what do you do? It's a totally different ball game than going and sitting in the deer stand on a, you know, a Saturday morning in November when all of a sudden it's July and all you have for a rifle is maybe granddaddy's old Mauser or more likely even you know some great great granddaddy's old service pistol. And what do you do when you run out of bullets for it? The author examines this. The, the story takes you from 
civilization where you can get any convenience you want, any, any survival need can be met by picking up a phone and ordering takeout or hopping in the car and going to the store and getting it. All you need is cash or credit. Now they strip away all those conveniences and they put you in a situation where, okay, you don't have any conveniences, nobody's bringing you a pizza when you're hungry. Uh, you gotta go out in the woods and get it. Now you got a prepper, he's probably got a hundred guns buried in the basement you know, and gobs and gobs of ammunition. But the truth is, guys, is if your house falls down or floods, as in the case of the story, what do you do? Uh, maybe you only grabbed one gun. You can't carry a hundred firearms with you or thousands of rounds of ammunition, so that's pretty pointless. Uh, you grab what you can and you run. So maybe you got one gun and hundred rounds of ammunition. Well, if you're a crack shot and never miss, that's a hundred squirrels or a hundred deer. But okay, now you have this dead animal. Uh, and the authors look at this. What do you do long term? You can use up all of those supplies that you have preserved carefully as a doomsday prepper. Um, but when your house falls down, you lose most of it. So you carry away what you do, but what do you do when those supplies run out? The authors look at the individual drive to survive versus the community's need to survive and prosper. Uh, individuals always want to better their situation. And by forming communities, the author explains the differences between the individual's ability to survive post-apocalypse uh, versus the larger pool of resources and skills that you would have in a community. I myself am a bit of a loner, guilty as charged. Uh, but they look at how, how far down the evolutionary chain we're willing to fall. Making fire is something that most people can't do. Go to a campground and just watch how many camp weekend campers were lighting their fire with gasoline and matches or pre-made fire logs or little backpacking stoves that you pour the gasoline in and do all the cooking on. Uh, all of those are great inventions and I have dozens of them uh, and I've been known to throw gasoline on a campfire a time or two myself. But the authors really do a good job of exploring what do you do when the gasoline runs out, when you don't have the matches. What the book examines is community versus individual. Individuals just have themselves to look out for. Maybe a friend. And as individuals in an emergency situation, you have very little social finances to play with. Your morals may come into direct conflict with your human desire to survive. The book examines how individuals can play out, how far they're willing to flex those social and moral rules, and then examines the same situations as a society, where you take a group of individuals and you have a community all working towards a common goal of survival. But is it enough just to survive? How far down the moral ladder is civilization willing to go? And how far can they support? Lucifer's Hammer examines slavery. It examines cannibalism as a method of survival and as a ritualistic tool to bind a community together. And it does so effectively. Uh, long pork has long been a, a tribal ritualistic oh, almost spiritual thing everybody who's eaten the long pork is bound together by this one thing in some tribal situations uh, throughout history it's been a religious experience experience and it's an accepted form of community bonding we don't always see it that way. Uh, but long. now the bad guys have been captured after a big battle. What do you do with them? In today's society, we would put them in Gitmo, or we would take them down to the county lockup. We would lock them up, 
and feed them and shelter them and clothe them, try and educate or re-educate them, and try eventually to make them contributing members of society. How does that work post-apocalypse? The authors explore a couple of issues. They put them on an island and turn it into a self-sufficient prison. Think Australia, if you're a bit of a history buff. Australia was a prison camp where the British took everybody they didn't want, dumped them on this little continent by themselves and says, all right, live or die, it's up to you. Well, that's pretty much how the, uh, the story goes at the ending with the cannibal enemy. You can keep them as prisoners, you can keep them as slaves, or you can execute them. You don't have the society's resources to put them in a jail and give them three meals and a cot. So already we've fallen off of the civilized rung that we sit at today. Whew, excuse me, folks. Wind shift a little bit. So now prisons are out. Rehabilitation is basically out. What do you do? You can keep them as slaves and use them as a labor force to help ensure your community's survival. And in the meantime, they're earning their own keep. So that's one way to do it. You can line them up and shoot them. They are the enemy. They tried to kill you. They would have tossed you in a stew pot. All you want to do is toss them in a hole in the ground. Seems fair. I, I, I buy into that level of morality. Or, the authors came up with that novel idea of the Australian prison. And then later on, if the prisoners wish to escape back into the wilds, the characters in the story seem to be willing to let that happen. They're pretty much, they're half starved, they don't have any tools, they don't have any weapons, but I don't know. I don't think I agree with that myself because bad guys always seem to find a way to keep on being bad guys. I have not. Then they bring in a natural disaster. In Lucifer's Hammer's case, they bring in a comet. Uh, the meteor eventually strikes the Earth and disrupts society as we know it. it. Takes us all the way from the peak of civilization we've achieved today, all the way to a pre-industrial society. So there's three main themes in the novel that I usually pick out. And I've read the book a couple of dozen times. Usually, the three that stand out to me the most is we have become, as the tool-using species, we have evolved technologically to the point where we are actually too far advanced to survive a sudden shift back to a pre-industrial society. We have actually become the species that not only can control, uh, can bring about their own extinction, but we also have the technology to prevent it. So the three main themes, like I said, uh, we've evolved to the point where we actually can't go back. Uh, the fragility of civilization is the second theme. They bring out the social aspects of what a technologically advanced society can have as far as morals and values. Then they bring in the human nature for the third main theme. Human nature is the easiest one to address. A society can afford to be as generous and, well, let's say, yeah, as liberal as their policies will allow with social programs. Uh, if you're out of work, you can get food stamps. If you're out of work, you can get Medicaid. Um, we can be that generous as a society because we have the technology and the economic systems in place to support that. Uh, more or less, you know, Democrats and Republicans will fight, but, you know, the bottom line is, is we can't actually afford most of these programs. We can afford to be that generous. But if you take away our technology and destroy our economic viability, then you have to look at how much can we really afford? If I'm struggling by myself, hunting squirrels in the woods, uh, just barely eking out a living, can I afford to be that generous to a family I find just over the hilltop? If I'm starving to death myself, can I share a meal? And 
the book addresses that and it explores that and mixes it in with the human nature aspect of the theme. Uh, some people will be that giving. Um, they are that generous. They'll share their last meal knowing that it's going to be their last meal because they're going to starve to death. But at least they starve to death with company. They go out with human dignity. And the novel explores that really well by taking the upper crust of society, what they call productive members in the novel there, um, and contrasting those with the gentlemen who end up being the black cats. They end up being the bad guys in, in the book. But what happens is the upper crust has the ability and the connections to see the disaster coming. And even though they don't know what's going to happen, they're not 100% certain, they can afford to make preparations. And then it explores, on the other half of the coin, uh, the people who cannot afford uh, to make those preparations. And it looks at the haves and the have-nots. And the haves have the power. Uh, he who has the food has the power in a situation like that. And the book explores just how generous a human will be on an individual level. And then again, as a society, and then it explores the technological aspects as well. So the individual basis is an individual will help another individual uh, most of the time. It's human nature to be as generous as possible, I think. Most people are good people. But it also explores the fact that when you're hungry, morals go out the window. Um, those people who would not ever think of shoplifting in modern society put into a wilderness situation or a situation where they don't have a society to support them and their traditional lifestyle get mean. You know, when you get hungry, morals go out the window until you get your next meal. And then after that, it's a meal to meal to meal, that day-to-day -day existence. The book explores that in great detail. Um, I am not obviously an orator, but if you haven't read the novel Lucifer's Hammer, I strongly recommend you do. Uh, there are no zombies, so you know not every book is perfect in my mind, but you know, uh, it is post-apocalyptic in nature. The societal aspects of uh, really bring into light how a society today, whereas an individual today can afford to be generous. A society today can afford to be generous, uh, but there are always catches, there are always loops. Um, back in the pioneer days, you had barn raisings. Your neighbors came over and helped put up your barn. It's just what good neighbors did. That was a community. Now we have a society, and there's a difference. Uh, a society you can spend your entire life in a city and never know the person three doors down. Where in a community, everybody knows everybody, they pull together, and even though they have their differences, they have their bickering, they have their gossip, um, in the end, what really matters is getting through the day and surviving to the next day. And in a community, I think that's, uh, that's more in touch with a reality. Uh, whereas in a society, when you need to worry about your next meal. You go down to the local welfare office, you go down to the food bank, uh, you go down and take out a loan. Uh, technology supports artificially um, the illusion of community and the book explores that very, very well. So many people today take the modern conveniences for granted. We've become this advanced civilization and for the first time that we know of in the history of the universe we have as a, have a species the ability to either bring about or prevent our own extinction but if an event were to happen that would take away all our new technological toys we have also evolved to the point where we've lost the skills that got about this civilization to begin with. Think about it. You get out of bed in the morning, pop a cup of coffee in a microwave, probably grab your breakfast out of a refrigerator, and it's a food that came probably halfway across the country in the back of a truck Mass production 
is probably one of our key features of a high-tech civilization. The on-demand ability to meet our basic survival needs. What the book explores is what happens when those conveniences and the on-demand quit working. Sorry folks, I'm uh, camped next to an airport apparently. Northern Minnesota. Part of what History River is all about and that Lucifer's Hammer explores in very good detail is just how far people can fall back with the loss of civilization's technology and still come back to a standard of living that we today might actually recognize. I like to think of it like this. If you get cold in your apartment, you turn the thermostat off. What happens when the thermostat no longer works? Do we as a species still have the skills to take after our caveman forefathers? They discovered fire, learned to tame it, and used it to meet their survival needs. The book explores whether or not a modern man can do the same thing. Sometimes the answer isn't pretty. The news is full of examples of people who've taken a backpack or a car load of modern technology and have gone out into the backwoods and the next thing you know the Channel 5 News is talking about their corpses. Not a pleasant thing. The book explores our spacefaring technology. We are a spacefaring species. Regardless of what you think of our technologically advanced society, the book explores how people would react if suddenly it was stripped away. Think about it. What happens when you're cold? You go to this. You turn on the thermostat, instant gratification. You're hot, you're cold. The turn of a dial brings the temperature up to a level you're comfortable with. When you're hungry, you go here. Swipe of a credit card, a few minutes time, instant gratification. You go home, pop the next meal in a microwave, fill the belly, turn on the TV, life is good. If you take away those amenities, people get mean. If you just examined what happened during uh, Hurricane Katrina down in New Orleans, People were without food, water, basic necessities that we take for granted every day. The book explores what happens when those are ripped away. And if you use Katrina as an example, it didn't take but about three days before there was riots, looting. And normally if you feel threatened, you pick up the phone, you dial 911, gentlemen like this show up. And in theory, at least, uh, they make it safer. 
we have developed into a civilization that has walked on the moon. Our satellites, our technology has explored the farthest reaches of our solar system. And even with the Voyagers, gone slightly beyond. Our children take for granted that instant gratification of when they need to know something, they can simply pick up a laptop, Google a question, and get an answer. And if it's on the internet, obviously it must be true, right? Uh, but if you take away the internet, a lot of our kids don't even read books anymore. And books are the written heritage of our species. We've gone from a verbal, an oral tradition of passing on knowledge to writing it down in a book. And we've taken those books, we've scanned them, put them on the internet. A lot of the books are rare now. The books that teach us the foundations, the building blocks of a modern society, um, aren't on the local library bookshelves. Now, what do you get? You know, how-to guides, the dummies guides to how to use Windows, to file your taxes. None of this stuff puts food on the table, teaches you how to make clothing, um, things as simple as shoes. The book explorers in the storyline, uh, that very fact. The, their store-bought clothes are literally not meant to last generations like they were uh, during the Depression era. They built rugged clothing that they could beat with a stick to get clean in boiling water. They boiled it in a pot over a fire outside. That was wash day. Um, now we have on-demand fluff-dry coin-op washers. Uh, you know, we can press a button, throw in a cup of detergent, a couple of quarters, walk away, watch TV, go do our grocery shopping, and when we come back in 45 minutes, we toss them in the dryer, and an hour after that, technically our clothes are done. If you tried to do that old style of laundry with a new material Space Age fabrics, you would find that they would just disintegrate. I started the History River trip myself. Um, being a bit of a rustic throwback myself, most of my clothing is canvas and wool. Um, I don't have any synthetic fibers. Uh, I did have a pair of quick dry pants. They lasted a couple of weeks. Uh, first time a uh, spark jumped out of the fire, I ended up with a hole. Um, that hole quickly unraveled and shredded up, and the next thing you know, I ended up with a pair of shorts. Um, a useful feature in the summertime, not so hot in Wisconsin or Minnesota winters, as I am now. Uh, it's these types. Hey folks, Mike Hatfield with History River. Doing my English paper on Lucifer's Hammer. Uh, about a 1978 novel written by Jerry Pornell and Larry Niven. Post-apocalyptic in nature. Um, it's not their first endeavor. They've written several other novels. Uh, all follow the general same outlines. Um, they show civilization the mundane day-to-day -day living of usually the upper crust. And then they contrast that with the, the down and outs, uh, the low blue collar worker, you can call it. Um, they show how for very granted we take moderate conveniences. And they build up the mundane, the boring, the day-to-day -day living of both sides of a uh, society, the haves and the have-nots and the technological aspects as well. The major theme there is, like I said, we have developed technologically to a point where if we were put into the situation of being thrust back into a pre-industrial society, the generation of people who built this nation during that industrial revolution are dead and gone. And today, let's face it, your grandparents, or if you're lucky to have a, a fourth generation, your great-grandparents may remember how it was done. Uh, but once those generations are gone, that, that knowledge is lost. We don't have that skill set. The book explores the aspects of you can go and get a book that'll teach you how to build a nuclear power plant. But in order to understand it, you have to have the 50 books that came before that. And we lack that basic foundational knowledge now. And I think that is what Lucifer's Hammer explores the best. Now, 
how we've evolved as a society to the point where we couldn't save our own butts in an emergency. I'm Mike Hatfield. That was my literary analysis on Lucifer's Hammer. The authors do a pretty good job of examining what an individual or a community really needs to survive. And basically in the woods I teach that there's four things that you have to make sure that you can have or create, especially in a primitive situation, to keep yourself alive. And the first one is shelter. Everybody thinks food. You won't starve to death for a month. Skinny like me, you might only last three weeks. But most people are packing on a couple of extra Big Macs. They've got a little wiggle room. So, four weeks. You're not going to starve. You'll be uncomfortable. You'll lack energy. You'll be lethargic. Uh, you'll be cranky. But you're not going to starve to death. So the very first thing you need is shelter. So, today, what do you do when you need shelter? You whip out plastic credit card, you rent an apartment, you sign a lease, you get a hotel. Um, shelter is very easy to create in modern society. But if you take away that credit card, or you take away the existence of condos, and hotels, and apartments, and you know houses, wipe those off the map. What do you do? Some structures will all obviously survive an apocalypse. There's enough old abandoned buildings that are half fallen down. Uh, pretty much proves that. They've survived tornadoes and winters. And would they survive a comet strike? Mm. Not at ground zero, but 100 miles away? Yeah, probably. At least a basement. But what do you do when you need shelter? You build one. You find one. You, you make do. You take on a squatter's life if you have to. That's the first core requirement for survival, and the authors ex explore that quite well. Um, second one you need is water. Obviously, in a snowstorm, you might only live three minutes without shelter, but even in perfect weather, you're only gonna live about three days without water. So, what do we do when we need water in modern society? Well, we go turn on the faucet, that's it. But even in modern society without a comet, uh, anybody has to turn on the news and all you find is boil alerts in this town because the septic server overflowed, or the floods in Katrina knocked out the water pipes, pipes freeze. So even with all the high-tech gadgets that we have today, uh, drinking water is only assured maybe 95% of the time. Well, take away the water treatment plants. Take away your aqua pures. Take away your reverse osmosis in your kitchen. And all of a sudden, water's a little harder to come by. Next thing you need is fire. Fire is going to help you purify your water. It's going to keep you warm, cook your food, ward off all those evil wild animals that crawl around in the woods, you know, if you're one of those. It's going to be able to make you, give you the ability to make tools. The authors explore this. What do you do when you get cold? You walk right over to the thermostat, crank it up from 68 to 72, and hope you can pay the bill at the end of the month. The story explains just how far down the evolutionary chain we can fall from the pinnacle of society that we have today to caveman status? Do we go back to the area where we have to relearn how to make fire? A lot of people don't know how. You take away their matches and lighters and all of a sudden you got a whole bunch of people start freezing to death. He examines very well the number of people that he believes could make the shift from high-tech civilization to backwoodsy camping. And it's not even camping, it's, it's survival. Camping always, to me, implies you're bringing out your sleeping bag, your Coleman stove, your freeze-dried foods, and I have some of those surrounding me here. The difference is, is most people don't know how to recreate those items 
if they were not to have them to start with. The learning curve uh, of civilization, unfortunately, has focused on the internet, how to run your new iPad. Uh, and these are things that keep modern day working. They keep modern civilization moving forward. It was all great things. But you unplug them, you yank the cord out of the power, and all of a sudden, all of those things become paperweights. The authors examine just how far back most people are, are able to go, even if they're willing. And unfortunately, the authors do a very good job of illustrating just how far up we've come and just how deadly the sudden absence is. We have become a society. Blech. Excuse me, folks, I haven't had my morning coffee. We have become a society so dependent on the modern technology that we have actually forgotten how we got here. It's these types of technological dependencies that the book uh, brings out in stark contrast to what our species used to go from caves to walking on the moon. And I think that's probably one of the most important themes that the book addresses. And it actually does bring it to a closure at the end. We as a species are dependent on technology. We are physically not adapted to the realities of living in a non-industrial society. We have always been the tool users. And without those tools, we are on the road to extinction. And so the book shows us that we can relearn skills. It costs us in lives, in time, in material, uh, blood, sweat, and tears that our ancestors have already generated to get us to where we are today. And the book explores how far back we can actually go as a society and still maintain those social values. So read the book. I hope you enjoy this video. Um, this is my literary analysis for Lucifer's Hammer by Jerry Pornell and Larry Niven circa about 1978. I will see you on the river.